Hello everyone and welcome to Bloody Queer, the YouTube channel where I discuss various topics ranging from microbiology, paleontology, evolutionary biology, modern and contemporary art history, horror cinema, and the occult. This video will serve as the first in the Bloody Queer archives and it includes a summer 2021 lecture I gave at the Rollins Museum of Art in Winter Park, Florida, formerly known as the Cornell Fine Arts Museum. And before we get started, I would just like to state that there is a brief discussion of rape in this video, so please feel free to skip it if you're not up for that, or check the description for timestamps where we will be covering that content. Additionally, I have linked to both the original video of, on the YouTube page of RMA, as well as the virtual viewer of the Path to Paradise exhibition in the description, and I would definitely encourage you to check both of those out. So thanks everyone, and see you soon, you bloody queers. Good evening, I'm Dr. Hisala Garbonell, curator at the Cornell Fine Arts Museum at Rollins College. And I wanna welcome all of you to tonight's program. Uh, if you have questions or comments throughout this talk, please uh, submit them through the comment box and we'll get to them at the end of the talk. So there'll be a chance, there will be a chance for a conversation. Hi, Isaac, welcome. We are delighted to have with us our speaker tonight. Isaac Gores, who is a recent Rollins graduate, who double majored in biochemistry, molecular biology, and art history with a minor in studio art. Additionally, Isaac was the Fred W. Hicks Curatorial Fellow during his senior year of undergraduate studies um, at the museum. And as a capstone for his curatorial fellowship, Isaac curator curated the exhibition that he'll be talking about tonight uh, titled uh, Path to Paradise, the Artistic Legacy of Dante's Divine Comedy. Uh, this exhibition is currently on view at the Cornell Fine Arts Museum at Rollins, and it will continue to be on view until August 29th. So if you haven't had a chance to see it, uh, we encourage you to stop by the museum and enjoy this amazing exhibition. Um, Isaac uh, will begin his graduate studies this fall. He wants to work as, a, uh, as an art conservator. And so the next step in his um, academic development is now to go on and pursue a master's of science in biology with a specialization in microbiology um, at Radboud University in the Netherlands. So we are delighted to have you, Isaac, and we look forward to hear your talk about Dante and about his artistic legacy and how that shows through in this exhibition that you curated for, uh, for the museum. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Isela. So hello everyone, my name is Isaac Gores and it's great to be here back at Rollins. Uh, additionally, thank you so much, Dr. Carbonell for that wonderful introduction. So today I will be discussing some of the artworks and artists featured in an exhibition that I guest curated at CFAM as the Fred W. Hicks Curatorial Fellow. And the exhibition, as you already know, is entitled Path to Paradise, The Artistic Legacy of Dante's Divine Comedy. And it was staged to commemorate the 700th anniversary of the poet Dante Alighieri's death in 1321. It features illustrated archival texts alongside artworks depicting episodes from the Divine Comedy. The Divine Comedy, of course, is a monumental epic poem composed of Dante's Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso. And on the right side of the slide, we can see a recent work entitled Porta Ultra Fergola uh, by a 2019 Rollins Studio Art alum who goes by the name of Friday. And although this work was not included in the exhibition, it is an example of inspiration drawn from Dante by a member of our immediate community in Central Florida. And I will discuss some of the other surprising ways that Dante has directly impacted Rollins campus later in the presentation. Additionally, in this presentation, I will discuss elements of potential occult inspiration found in the Dante illustrations of Salvador Dali, attempting to assign them iconographic origin. So let's get started. First, let's start with a lightning speed introduction to Dante for those who are unfamiliar. So Dante Alighieri was an Italian poet, philosopher, and political theorist who was born in Florence in 1265, which was a long time ago. And he is perhaps most famous for writing La Commedia, or the comedy, which was renamed La Divina Commedia, or the Divine Comedy, after his death. 
The Divine Comedy was a monumental epic poem consisting of three larger sections, or kentish. These were Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso once again. And each chronicled Dante's supposed journey through a realm of the Catholic afterlife. In 1283, Dante married Gemma Donati in an arranged marriage. And this was even though he had already professed his love for Beatrice, who uh, died, um, I believe, when she was like 19 or even younger. So Dante had met this girl in his youth and immediately fell in love with her. And as you'll see it later in the presentation, she's included in the Divine Comedy as well as some of Dante's other works. So in 1302, while Dante was away from Florence in Rome and or Siena, a faction of Dante's political party, so they were pro-papal, they were pro the Pope, known as the Guelphs, exiled the opposing faction from Florence. And Dante, unfortunately, was in the portion of the Guelphs that were exiled from Florence by the ruling Guelphs. So if Dante were to return to Florence after this event, he would have been burned at the stake for crimes that he did not commit. Thus, he was forced to live in exile in Ravenna until his death in 1321. And the Divine Comedy was primarily written and compiled in the decade preceding Dante's death, meaning that it was finished in Ravenna. And Dante is actually still buried in Ravenna today. So here we can see a gallery view of the exhibition text for Path to Paradise in the Zolo Lakeview Gallery of CFAM. This exhibition contains eight works of art and illustrated texts by a diverse range of artists spanning multiple centuries from the Italian Quattrocento through the global contemporary. Path to Paradise, the artistic legacy of Dante's Divine Comedy, once again will be open through August 29th, 2021. And I would definitely encourage you guys to come see it in person. Alternatively, however, if you're not able to come in person, all of our exhibitions are available online. So be sure to check that function out as well. So I'm just going to read an excerpt from the exhibition wall text in order to help familiarize you with the exhibition. So in the decade preceding his death, the Florentine poet and polymath Dante Alighieri compiled the Divine Comedy, universally identified as a masterwork of Italian literature. In the narrative epic, Dante recounts his journey through the realms of the Catholic afterlife, describing instances of suffering and salvation he witnessed during his travels. Guided by the Roman poet Virgil, Dante explores hell, purgatory, and finally heaven, where Virgil is replaced by Dante's lost love, Beatrice. With its graphic depictions of eternal punishment and redemption, Dante's Divine Comedy has served as an artistic and moral template for artists, writers, politicians, and religious leaders since its original publication. In its over 700 years of existence, the poem has been illustrated by artists including Sandro Botticelli, Gustave Dore, and Salvador Dali. It has been referenced by the likes of John F. Kennedy and Pope Francis. More recently, the poem's first cantica, Inferno, has even been converted into a video game for PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 gaming consoles. And surprisingly, as weird as it may sound, you actually can play through Dante's Inferno if you have a PlayStation 3, an Xbox, or an emulator that will, will allow you to play those systems on a PC. So here we can see the 2010 video game packaging and cover art. And although the game, how should I say this, was an extremely loose adaptation of Dante's Inferno that only followed Dante to the base of Mount Purgatory, it still represents an artistic adaptation of Dante. And art historians are increasingly recognizing that digital experiences such as video games are legitimate modes of creative expression that demand academic inquiry. Unfortunately, though, Dante's Inferno was a pretty bad video game that also ran into problems with objectification of female characters and some Orientalist tropes. So hopefully, as more and more video games are created by women, people of color, and individuals belonging to the LGBT plus community, the industry will shift in a more diverse direction. So now I would just like to quickly run through some of the works on display in the exhibition. So if you would like to hear more about any of these works, feel free to ask specific questions in the chat and I will address them at the end of the presentation or come back for a more um, in-depth exhibition tour on Friday, August 6th at 11 a.m. Eastern time. So right on the title wall displayed in a vitrine, we saw it earlier, uh, is this work. 
So it's a late 19th century Dante inkwell. Through my research, I actually attributed this inkwell to an Italian bronze foundry in Naples. And the inkwell was likely created as a souvenir item for early European tourists. In the label for this object, I, I talked about how the destruction of Pompeii by Mount Vesuvius, which was very violent and fiery, mirrored some of the visions uh, in Dante's hell. And Naples is right next to Mount Vesuvius and, and Pompeii. And I think that that could be one of the reasons that this souvenir was created there. Additionally, we have another sculptural work in the exhibition that wasn't inspired by the Divine Comedy because it predates it. But artifacts like it actually inspired some of our illustrators that we'll talk about later. So here we have a Roman sarcophagus from the second century CE depicting the rape and abduction of the Sabine woman. So it's at the end of the Zolo Lake U Gallery in the exhibition. And the act of sexual violence kind of depicted on the front of the sarcophagus is actually part of the founding mythology of Rome. So in that sense, even though it is a rape scene, it would have served to heroize the person interred inside of the sarcophagus. And before the first and second centuries CE, Romans primarily re relied on cremation to honor their dead. However, burial would soon surpass cremation with the introduction and popularization of the sarcophagus. And early sarcophagi were either blank or featured a wreath of vegetal matter on their fronts, while later sarcophagus styles evolved to include abstract patterns and images of people either battling or reveling at a party. So depending on the content of the sarcophagus, it's actually relatively easy to date it and say this is the period when this type of sarcophagus would have been most prevalent. We actually see that. So this, this work isn't in the exhibition. It's in the British Museum in London. But here we can see the work of Baccio Baldini, an Italian contemporary of Botticelli who illustrated the Divine Comedy in collaboration with Botticelli around 1481. And in this illustration, Canto 10 of Inferno, we can see that marble sarcophagi served as implements of torture in Dante's Inferno. So much like the marble sarcophagus that we saw on the last slide and in the exhibition, in this image, we can see at least eight sarcophagi kind of like on fire with people inside. So after entering the city of Dis in the sixth circle of hell, Dante described witnessing the punishment of the Epicureans, or those who believed in life that their souls would die with their physical bodies. The artist depicted at least, once again, eight unique styles of marble sarcophagi, each inspired by a certain type from antiquity and further embellished then by the artist's imagination. And although there's no direct connection between the specific sarcophagus that we saw on the last slide and this engraving, it serves as an example of the types of sarcophagi that would have inspired Baldini. And we did actually include an illustration of this engraving um, on, on the label for, for the sarcophagus. Additionally, across from the sarcophagus, we actually have an engraving by Baldini in the exhibition. So it illustrates Inferno 2 when Dante is meeting Virgil and then they see a vision of Beatrice at the center telling them, you know, urging them to go through the realms of the afterlife to meet her in heaven. And then towards the upper right, they go through the portal to hell, uh, labeled per me, which means through me in Italian. Additionally, we have two works by the Spanish surrealist Salvador Dali in the exhibition, one illustrating Canto V of Purgatorio on the left, and the other illustrating Canto 23 of Paradiso on the right. So Dali created a total of 100 illustrations for the Divine Comedy. He was actually commissioned by the Italian government to illustrate an edition of the Divine Comedy that was commemorating the 700th anniversary of Dante's birth. However, that became problematic when Italians pointed out, why, why isn't there an Italian artist doing it? Dante was an Italian artist, so let's find an Italian artist. So ultimately, Dal Dali had to find uh, another publisher. But he did finish the, the catalog of prints and, and publish them under another publisher in 1964. And today, 
I will discuss how Dali's gender bending um, representation of Jerian, so that's a giant from Greek mythology that Dante included in Inferno. And here we can see Salvador Dali's representation of Jerian as a kind of dragon that is carrying Virgil and Dante on his back. So I'll discuss how Dali's representation of Jerian likely relied on esoteric symbology derived from widely distributed occult imagery of Baphomet, an invented pagan idol commonly associated with Satan. And yeah, so it's like not really that, that drastic or crazy of an observation to make, but I think specifically the aspects of, of this image where, for example, Dali added breasts to the figure of Jerian when Jerian is in fact male. So there he's propelling Jerian into the territory of the androgynous and that demands analysis through this lens. So first, let's establish what Jerian is supposed to look like. So in the circa 6th century Athenian, 6th century BCE Athenian vase, Jerian is depicted on the right being slain by Heracles in one of his labors. So Heracles is on the left here wearing the pelt of the Nemean lion, which he killed as his first slaver. And uh, he's attacking the three-headed giant Jerian on the right. So he, Jerian is the one holding all of the shields. In Greek mythology, he's described variably as having either three heads and one body or three interconnected bodies. And obviously this is different from the illustration that we saw with Dali. But why is this? So indeed, Dante purposefully changed the appearance and descriptions of many mythological creatures in his version of hell, uh, as hell was supposed to be inherently unpredictable. And this was completely intentional. So he would do this and then write about as Dante the Pilgrim, because he was narrating these visions, he would then write about how he was surprised, how the characters from mythology looked different than what he expected. And here, John Ciardi, a Dante translator and poet, discusses Dante's descriptions of Jerian. Quote, some of the details of Dante's Jerian may be drawn from the Book of Revelations, but most of them are almost certainly his own invention. A monster with the general shape of a dragon, but with the tail of a scorpion, hairy arms, a gaudily marked reptilian body, and the face of a just and honest man. The careful reader will note that the gaudily spotted body suggests the leopard, the hairy paws, the lion, and the human face represents the, the essentially human nature of fraud, which thus embodies corruption of the appetite, of the will, and of the intellect. So initially, depictions of Jerian followed Dante's like wingless description that Chiardi really summarized really well for us. So as you can see here in 1345, this illuminated manuscript gave Jerian the front paws of a lion and the tails of a scorpion. He almost looks like a leopard seal kind of, but as you can see, it it's wingless and it's male, which both differ from the illustration by Dolly. And then here is another example of a wingless male Jerian from circa 1370 in Naples. And then around 1450, Priamo della Quercia added wings to his miniatures of Jerian. And it is unclear why um, Prima della Quercia uh, made this edition, but it seems to be the first instance of a Jerian with wings, which is a departure from the text. So I'm not aware of any earlier depictions of a winged Jerian, but it is certainly possible. However, this could be the earliest one extant. And then jumping forward a ways, in 1861, Gustave Dore, a French artist, illustrated the Divine Comedy, and he depicted Jerian as a large wyvern-like monster flying with Dante and Virgil on his back. So CFAM has a second edition copy of Duray's Illustrated Inferno in the exhibition, which was graciously loaned by the Rollins Archives and Special Collections at Olin Library. And this is the illustration for the canto featuring Jerian. So looking at these images side by side, this is where we start to see Salvador Dali drawing direct inspiration from Duray's earlier illustrations. So even though they were created almost a century before Dali's, Duray's illustrations were clearly referenced by Dali in the creation of his Divine Comedy woodcuts. However, the, de the depictions are not identical and important differences exist. For example, a dramatic rendering of landscape is depicted by Duray, 
while Dolly really pushes this into the background and minimizes it and focuses on, um, on the monster. Additionally, Dali rotated Jerian 180 degrees to face the viewer, and he added female presenting breasts and horns to the hybrid creature. So undoubtedly, Dali was familiar with esoteric symbolism and could have conceivably come into contact with this illustration. So the so-called uh, Sabbatic Goat of Mendez, the Greek name for a settlement in Egypt, was first drawn by French occult author Eliphas Levi, in 1856 and was intended to symbolize the equilibrium of opposites. And Baphomet, which is the, the invented uh, pagan deity that this figure represents, quickly became associated with Satan and Satanism. So note how Baphomet is pictured by Levi as having female breasts situated above a phallic caduceus. So most depictions of Baphomet after Levi rendered the male deity with breasts. So that um, after Levi, after 1856, it became kind of like a normal trend in art to make, to make figures or images of the devil appear to be androgynous. And then interestingly, and as a final note, in 1984, Dolly designed a deck of um, limited edition tarot cards. And intriguingly, the card for the devil features a female figure with a horn sprouting from her knee. So much further research is needed to decode the symbols of this tarot deck and elucidate Dolly's original inspiration. But both this and Dolly's rendering of Jerian as, you know, a kind of androgynous monster underline the possibility that Dolly had knowledge of occult symbolism and included, actively included references to it in his artwork. And I would argue aptly included references to it, especially when you take into consideration the task. He was designing a, a tarot deck and illustrating Dante's Inferno. So what better way to do that than really lean into occult readings of your works? And I, I think it was very successful and we're still talking about it to this day. However, more research is really needed to confirm that Dolly encountered materials either written by Levi or other authors in the occult. So now I would like to turn to the larger Rollins campus and point out some connections to Dante that might surprise some of you. So first, I would like to point out that a fragment from Dante's tomb in Ravenna is included in the Rollins Walk of Fame right outside of the new Kathleen W. Rollins Hall. So definitely go check that out if you're near campus. So essentially kind of like on Mills Lawn and like look at the big building by Mills Lawn and then it's just to the left of the entrance when you're looking at the building from the front. And additionally, the largest painting in the Path to Paradise exhibition is this one and it's entitled The Divine Comedy. And it was completed by um, Tom Peterson, who was a Rollins studio art professor. So it was completed in 2001 while the, the artist was reading the text. Additionally, this is a new um, acquisition for CFAM, so we're very happy to have it here. And this is, has become easily my favorite painting in the exhibition just because it, I hadn't seen it until the exhibition opening. So this exhibition was really curated behind the scenes without a lot of direct interaction with the objects, of course, because of COVID. So just seeing it in person and seeing, you know, the surface of it, it has a really interesting like sheen to the way that the oil paint is applied. So I definitely recommend going in person just to see this artwork. And then finally, I would like to revisit Porta Ultra Fergola by Friday, the 2019 Rollins Studio Art alum. So a version of the inscription around a portal in this pigment print, abandon all hope you who enter here, is repeated over the portal to hell in Inferno. And I don't, I don't think that a lot of people know that that phrase kind of originated with Dante, but it did. And also I think it's, it's really playful and intriguing how, how Friday has used the Ultra Fergola mirror so that the image of the wavy structure at the center is actually their version of a mirror created by the Italian functional designer Sotsas in 1970. So in that way, it's kind of like a synthesis of multiple different Italian art forms. And I, I really just like the way that the colors interact with each other. So um, also you can purchase 
if they're not sold out, you can you can purchase little uh, stickers of this work um, on the artist's website. So with that, I would like to take the time to thank the Cornell Fine Arts Museum and its wonderful staff, uh, as well as the Rollins College Archives and Special Collections at, Olin's, at Olin Library. Dr. Fred W. Hicks for funding my position, of course. Uh, both Dr. Yuzala Carbonell, the curator at CFAM, and Dr. Anna Heller, the Bruce A. Beale director of CFAM, for providing their unending support. Um, Professor Zhang and Walton from the library, and Dr. Kimberly Dennis for um, help translating Italian. So I certainly could not have been able to do any of this without you. Um, thank you all so much. And with that, I would like to open up the discussion for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac, for that wonderful presentation and for sharing so many insights into the works and also into the process that that you engaged in to research and uncover some of the some of the information and, and the context and background that you shared with us. Um, so we have a couple of questions in the comment section um, of this stream. Uh, before we go into the questions, I was wondering if you can talk broadly about um, you know, about the project, because when when we started thinking about your capstone uh, exhibition project for the fellowship, um, you had several ideas that you had proposed. And I just want to share with everyone who's joining us tonight that th this was Isaac's uh, theme that he chose and his proposal is the museum doesn't um, didn't uh, decide the theme. This was generated by by Isaac in cons consultation with, of course, with with us. But um, once you arrived at this theme and you decided that this is what you wanted to research, what was one of the big uh, takeaways from the project? Is there something that surprised you a lot about choosing this particular theme and and? and researching it, or what is that one big thing to take away after this experience? Yeah, I would definitely say that um, the largest thing is just that um, Dante is, of course, a lot of reading, which <laughs> I wasn't really prepared for. And then also um, just that, you know, like, oh, it's a lot to kind of explain, and there's a lot of vocabulary to go over, because not only is this an exhibition of artworks referencing Dante and inspiring certain Dante illustrators, it's also an exhibition about an artwork. The Divine Comedy is a poem, uh, which is an art form. And also, I think it's kind of, as an English speaker who doesn't know much Italian, uh, you're already cut out from a lot of the Divine Comedy because the, the Divine Comedy was written in rhyming Italian. So in the Tuscan dialect, Terza Rima was invented by Dante to kind of like piece together long strings of rhyming triplets. So um, in that sense, like it's more difficult to rhyme in English than it is in Italian too. So the translations that I was using to access the Divine Comedy wouldn't always rhyme. So I think that um, in that sense, like some of these, um, artworks can be almost like a window um, into the mind of Dante when perhaps it's not even what what the artist was intending. Absolutely, and it makes it a, a, lot, a lot more challenging, right, for you as a guest curator to have to deal with all these different la layers mm -hmm. that uh, that you have to navigate in order to get to the substance that you want to work with and then decide how, what and how you want to convey to the viewer, to the visitor who's who's there um uh, discovering the exhibition and navigating um, from work to work and reading the text wonderful so we have a question here from uh, our, our director dr anna heller um, she says she's wondering if your research showed that similar dante inkwells uh, referring to the first work that you talked about were available elsewhere in italy the trope of uh, getting inspiration directly from the divine Dante should have been rather irre uh, irresistible for writers everywhere. Would you would you say so? And did yeah. You find, yeah. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. But unfortunately, so we actually don't know where exactly um, the inkwell in the exhibition came from. But uh, we only found one other inkwell, which is um, currently in a museum in Australia. 
And that one, um, its provenance had assigned it to um, to the foundry of Septino de Angelis and Sons, which is in Florence. So um, it is possible that other foundries could have made them, but to to my knowledge, only only one had really you know innovative and created the the top. But it's it's a really cool mechanism. Like the top swings open, and then the head is just hollow, and you put ink in it where Dante's brain would be. So they were very clever in the late 19th century. And it's quite an interesting object. And I, and, and I must say, you know, our team at the museum did a fantastic job uh, displaying it, right? It's displayed um, in inside a, a box and then it has a mirror in the back. And so mm -hmm. visitors are able to see, even though it's not displayed in the round, you can see the back of it. It's quite an interesting, uh, an interesting object. And for something so small, uh, the features in the face, the the, it, the expression is it's quite intense, right? Yeah, very. Um, Anna has another uh, another question. She says, "Did you find other references to the occult in Dante's work within or outside the Inferno portfolio?" Well, yes. So for that, I would have to say Dante's entire deck of um, tarot cards. So there were other tarot cards with even more explicit references to the occult. For example, all of the um, cards of coins or pentacles um, include multiple pentagrams on them, which was an established tradition um, in tarot cards. But the whole tradition of tarot, as you know, like a reading of of your future, really originated in like the mid to late eighteenth century. Before then, in Italy and France, it was played as kind of like a suit game, like um, how the and it's still played to this day, but how people like, I, I don't really know the rules of it, but essentially it's just like a game that people play with cards. Um, but so that kind of all like evolved into reading people's futures at the same time that um, that Levi and other occult authors were publishing on Baphomet and all of the other images. So that's why, that's why I think it's possible that um, Adeli did encounter certain occult references um but there's definitely also links of other surrealist um, painters and authors to alchemists and other certain traditions that uh, might be considered esoteric by the rest of us absolutely and in dali's case you know he was a a, a researcher and a, a seriously studied the traditions that preceded him in art history, in the sciences, in philosophy. So it may very well be that he was well versed with some of these authors and some of the illustrations you showed. Um, there's another question here from Lainey. She says, the tarot deck by Dali is so interesting. Are there any other interesting tidbits from your research into this deck, especially from a queer perspective? Ooh, good question. Well, um, I can't think of any off the top of my head, actually, but um, I will definitely send you any if I encounter them. Um, I know that um, some, the, he does reference a lot of the times like other paintings or he's very like self-referential in a lot of his works. So even in the card that I showed, it might reference a, a Dolly painting and Yazala would be better at answering that than me. Um, but yeah, so in certain ways, he could have referenced really any number of works. And although the um, people who re-editioned the deck at Tashin had a team of art historians come through it, I'm sure that there are still um, connections that haven't been explored. So, yeah. Absolutely. And there's a lot of symbolism that uh, symbols that appear in that uh, tarot card deck that are very delinean, very easily identifiable, you know, in the one that you showed, particularly the um, butterfly. Bye. Keep in mind that this is a project that he did later in his life. So there are decades of, of his work behind him, of him working through some of these same, uh, some of this iconography that comes up um, throughout the decades, right, in his, in his work. Excellent. I wonder, um, Isaac, in this whole process, uh, what surprised you the most? You talked about some of the challenges that you encountered. Um, was there something that really surprised you in this project? Yeah, I would have to say. So originally, when we included the, um, the sarcophagus in the exhibition, 
originally that was not planned. So we had a list of works and the sarcophagus was not on it. And then Yazala came to me and was like, we're going to have to put the sarcophagus at the end of the hallway. And at first I was really disappointed, but then I thought, wait, and I brought up Baldini and I saw that Baldini had, you know, illustrated um, Canto 10 with all of the different types of Roman sarcophagi. And it, it was really the perfect inclusion. And then I wanted to include that in the exhibition. And also I think that this, that part of the exhibition in particular really reveals that um, Baldini was potentially expanding on kind of like a, a protein form established by Botticelli because all of Baldini's illustrations um, were after the drawings of Botticelli, some of which are now lost. So um, the only surviving uh, drawing by Botticelli of Inferno um, Canto 11 features pretty much like blank rectangular prisms for the sarcophagi and they're not really elaborated at all. So just the fact that Baldini either went on to, to decorate them and fill them in, or um, potentially he was copying a more complete version of Canto 10. I mean, it just, it lends him uh, more artistic credence in my opinion. Yeah, I think that, that was one aspect of this exhibition and this whole process that really, uh, kind of drove the curatorial narratives to a certain extent, at least that portion of it, right? Mm -hmm. Because for those of us who are not familiar with what we're talking about, we had a space limitation and we had a work of art that um, we needed to, to figure out how, how to display it in that particular location because of space, weight and material limitations. It had to basically be there. Um, and so we had to make a decision as curators, right? Uh, to either find a way in which we could incorporate it into the narrative of the exhibition, if at all possible. And if it was not possible, then we needed to make it clear that that object was not part of the show. And Isaac brilliantly researched that and found a, a legitimate and very important substantial connection with the theme of the exhibition. So it was kind of unexpected on my part. It was unexpected on Isaac's part. That's and it worked beautifully to tie all these objects together. And I agree with you 100%, Isaac, that the inclusion of this object um, provides even more depth to the telling of the story and the, the exploration of Dante's artistic legacy in this exhibition. Definitely. Um, and, and one other thing that I wanted to say is that if you haven't seen the show, when you go see it, um, you'll notice that the most recent work is from 2010? the Tom Peterson painting, 2001. 2001. 2001. So you have contemporary in interpretations of, of Dante and contemporary imaginings of Dante uh, using very modern type of modern contemporary uh, vocabulary and uh, colors, et cetera, going all the way back to ancient times with that sarcophagus. So really in, in a very small number of objects, you have a wide range of explorations into this particular theme. Any other questions or comments? And then we have the books. The books, can you talk a little bit about the books from uh, these rare books that we have, the illustrated books that we have that are from the archives and special collections from Olin Library? Sure, yeah, so we have um, one, um, illustrated by Gustave Dure, which I kind of talked about a little. So that was um, the the image of Jerrion that Dali was inspired by directly. And um, that one, I think, was, was published uh, or republished as the second edition, so in 1875. Um, and then also we have, I think, an earlier um, second edition by Michelangelo Cittani. And that was really trying to map out um, the like because geographers and and like literary scholars back then used to argue over the exact you know mechanics of how Dante's hell and purgatory and um, paradise were laid out and they would actually like have like ongoing arguments about the geometries of Dante's afterlife so um there's also right now it's opened to uh the ordering of purgatory so it's kind of a schematic of the mountain of purgatory. 
But um, unfortunately, I don't have an image of that on me right now. But I was, uh, Yazella and I were talking about that in the, um, in the print study room and looking at it. And it really made sense why it was adapted into a video game because you could just see the different levels and it was, it just made sense. So I, I definitely, uh, I really enjoyed working with the Rollins College Archives and Special Collections. Yeah, and I, I wanted to mention that these are only two of the books that um, that they have uh, that we have at Olin Library and the special uh, collections and archives that address Dante's and in, uh, Dante's Inferno. There were uh, several others, and we had to pare it down, right, and, and pick mm -hmm. the ones that best illustrated the point that Isaac wanted to make in the exhibition. There were these very small. Um, pocket like pocket editions of mm. of uh of dante that didn't have any illustrations so we decided not to include them but uh which are from early late 19th century i believe early 20th century and those are part of the collection mm -hmm. so just interesting to see the the rich variety in which dante manifests <laughs> in in art and culture right is there anything else that you want to share with with us isaac before we wrap up today's program no but just thank you thank you guys and thank you for the platform to share my research and for allowing me to do this exhibition which i i really had a fun time and i really enjoyed it and it was a great um professional development opportunity so thank well, it's, a, it's a fantastic project so congratulations again for all of you uh who join us tonight thank you again for joining us in this space um we have several other events happening the rest of and then we will see you in the galleries hopefully this fall uh with more tours and artist talks in person in the meantime, you can visit us at rollins.edu slash CFAM. Visit our exhibition page, pages and scroll down for the virtual 360 tour of this exhibition and all the other exhibitions that are on view um, right now. This season will be up until August 29th, and then we'll close for a little bit to change out and install our new exhibitions for the fall. So we hope to see you um, in our social media pages and our websites and of course in our galleries. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Take